we go straight to somebody who is in a very unique position to be part of one of the fastest growing companies in all of Europe and one of the hottest unicorns in Berlin. So this is a company which is valued now at $2.8 billion in the last fundraising round. And beside that, he's been like in many, many startups. So he's been like in very aggressive, hyper growth environments. So I think he really knows how to scale a team. So when Niv Liran, our next speaker, who is the uh, chief product officer at Auto One and also the co leader of the technology team, he's like when you joined, it was a five people team. Now it's like 150 people. So he's gone really through some hyper growth. And the company is not only valued at 2.8 billion, it's also making more than a billion revenue. So it's actually some real serious business. So I'm very eager to learn from you how you scale the business and how you bring the tech stack up. Thank you very much for Thank joining you. us here. So hi, welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you today on how we've built uh, our tech team from, as Philip said, from five people to today around 250, and how did we scale it through uh, periods of quite quick growth. Uh, so I will talk a bit about Auto One for those of you who don't know it, very quickly about myself, and then I will walk you through our principles of how do we run our tech team. So we are Europe's largest car dealer uh, to this date, and we do this by providing the easiest and fastest way to trade a second-hand car across Europe by creating liquidity, meaning a dealer in Cluj can very easily order a used German car online and have it delivered to uh, his dealership. Um, so we buy cars from private sellers. What we do for them is Selling a car is a very tedious process. You have to meet people, you have to put ads online, test drive, etc., etc. We eliminate all that. Um, you don't know the actual market value when you sell your car. And of course, if you live in Berlin, you can usually only sell around Berlin. You cannot go anywhere else to sell your car. Dealers, on the other hand, uh, have issues with getting the right car for the consumer. So if you go to your local dealer, you say, I really like Audi, I want an Audi, he will need to hunt one down for you if he doesn't have it on stock. And uh, they too are mostly restricted to local supply. So the, the very basic funnel is uh, you as a private seller, you visit one of our consumer websites. We have one in, uh, and it's, I mean, for those of you who cannot be German or Dutch, it's, it basically means we buy your car. And you set up an appointment, you show up at one of our branches, and we make an evaluation of your car, and then we put it on auto1.com. Some numbers, so we had 2.2 billion revenue in 2017, that's 50% over 2016. Uh, we traded 420,000 units, 240% compounded annual growth, and we have about 45,000 European dealers uh, on our network. Quickly about myself, so I was born in Tel Aviv. Uh, my father is from Romania, from Rosov. Uh, I studied computer science, did my MBA at INSEAD, uh, went to work for Groupon for three years, and then I, uh, I joined Auto One after a quick stint at Rocket Internet. Yeah. So, quickly through principles. There are three uh, principles, ownership, laser focus, and transparency, and by those we run our department. And in order to understand ownership, we actually need to go through how we structure the department through the different company stages. And we start with 2014, 2015, uh, where the company was in a hyper growth stage. Our application was a quite um, monolithic. We had 10 engineers in the beginning of this period. We grew up to 50. Features were quite um, small and isolated, and they were very quick uh, priority changes as well. And so we structured the group um, based around applications. So we would have the consumer applications, we would have the back office applications used internally, and we would have uh, the B2B applications, which were basically for the dealers. We also had two, a team called Firefighters, which was used to make the other teams available uh, for feature, feature work and maintaining the platform. Uh, stuff that worked well in this structure, so communication was pretty easy, very small teams mean uh, very small need for, to, 
communicate across the group. Very small feature also eliminate this. Uh, onboarding was super quick because everybody knows the application top down, and then it's very easy to get to know um, what's your work, what you need to do as an engineer, and what, what is the next steps. Same for product managers. Fast delivery, so when you have application specialization, people know very quickly what needs to be done in order to deliver something. Uh, firefighters were amazing, so they basically kept the team super focused on delivering more and more and more features to enable growth rather than be uh, entangled all the time with live issues. And um, the complexity of the platform fitted the team size, especially in the beginning. Stuff that we could see that could be improved. Um, so small teams are vulnerable. So if you have someone on a leave, um, you feel it immediately. 33% reduction in productivity. 50% if the team is very small. Um, you have very, very uh, hard time doing parallelized work. So when the team is two or three or four, working on stuff in parallel becomes quite slow. Um, anything that's medium scope and above, when you want to launch a new product or a new or quite big new feature is basically requiring uh, blocking the team for weeks at end. And so we continued growing the company. Uh, in 2016, the company was uh, still in a high growth stage, but the features became a bit bigger. Uh, the pipeline and priority changes became a bit more stable. And uh, we basically deepened the application specialization by creating back-end and front-end teams or mobile teams in some cases. And uh, we started feeling a bit the pain, and, but still a lot of stuff worked well. So textbook specialization was at its peak. Stuff was delivered quickly and very, very uh, efficiently, and it was pretty stable. Application ownership was, again, amazing. So the, the tech leads knew their application inside out. They could specify the technical side very quickly. PMs knew the application quite well. Um, and basically, whoops, uh, we also created a couple of core teams, which helped us, again, keep some focus. So QA was one core team. Then we also started moving to microservices architecture, which was assisted by another core team. And of course, there were some other things. But uh, at this point, when we were about 100 people, we started also feeling some pain. And that pain was mainly a, around ownership of cross-platform uh, features and cross-platform work, basically because um, it's quite difficult when you have groups that specialize in applications to make them talk to each other and make sure everything gets released at the same time, everything is done uh, properly considering the whole integration and things that must work across the platform. Stakeholder relations and internal communications were becoming a pain. So our stakeholders, they basically had to sync between a couple of PMs, and more often than not, they had to sync through me. Um, ownership in general was not clear when uh, a feature was done across the, the group. So who owns? something that's touching both internal tools and uh, the consumer-facing product. So the consumer-facing guy would say, it's not me. The uh, internal tools guy would say, hey, look, this is them. And there would be no overarching owner. Feature rollouts were, were of course, a pain in the situation. And QA was also a bit of a pain because they were not specializing in a full integration test. Firefighters became pretty useless when you have 100 uh, engineers. If nobody can keep up with the code. And so we decided to uh, change the structure as a demonstration. So somebody's, yeah. The orange lines that you see are all about uh, the communication needs that had to be done um, when you want to release something. In this example, it's the logistics self-service platform which involved five different teams who all had to communicate sync releases, and it was very clear to us that this structure needs to change. And so we thought uh, towards 2017 to switch to uh, basically business line ownership. So instead of consumer applications and B2B applications, there would be one owner for um, 
each business line. So the requirements were uh, to reflect the business structure, VMs would own the, the business area, full stack teams that need to, can release front end, back end, mobile all together as, as one. And we came up with, it's a vertical technology of course, and we came up with the, the following groups. So there would be a consumer group that was focused on private consumer products, and the private consumer products would be our websites and as well as uh, the whole purchasing flow. The merchant group would focus on B2B, and the core group would focus on everything else. Don't tell them that, but uh, that's the way it is. And so we basically obliterated quite a lot of the organization, and we switched to um, the, the business-based uh, structure. And now we had a logistics team that could do all of the above. They delivered it very, very successfully, and uh, it was very clear that this was the right change to do. So if you look at what worked well, PM ownership was now very clear. Stakeholders were super happy that they had one person to work with. The vertical tech ownership was super helpful because there was no need to sync anymore, so everyone could, could uh, release whatever they wanted. Uh, the core teams were also very, very good because they provided support for the whole thing. And uh, the, we had to shout the applications. So for example, our back office was one big application. We had to shout it, but this also enabled people to release gradually. Some lessons that we learned from this were, uh, first of all, we underestimated how much effort it is to shout an application and to make it stable. Um, vertical ownership actually requires more teams with a bit more uh, technical depth that, than we originally estimated. And the reverse has happened. So if in the past we've had uh, issues around who owns a feature, which is cross-platform, now we have uh, another kind of thing, which is who owns the, the back office application. But as it's shouted, this issue is not so big. And of course, it's a bit less flexible to move people across projects and features when you have uh, business specialization. Uh, the second principle is laser focus, so how to keep the team focused at work, because as you probably know, it's very, very easy to get distracted uh, when you work in tech. So there is this line of code that you don't like and you want to refactor. There is, oh, this would be so nice to have an extra field here for the business. And there, is a lot, there are a lot of distractions that happen. And what we believe is, um, first and foremost, we want to enable our business to do what they want. So whatever we release is designed so that the business can tweak it uh, as they please. We are a strong believer in 80-20 and MVP. So we want to deliver something that works in 20% of the time, has 80% of the functionality, and helps us get transactions as fast as possible. So there is no need to build, you know, the whole building. You can just build a facade and see how if people try to enter the store. Uh, we do scrum, but we don't do it religiously. Teams are actually quite free to, to choose the way they want to work. We control engineering tasks in the same way that we control feature work. So there needs to be some business justification uh, for refactoring things, for releasing new versions of things. And we are strong believers in fast onboarding. So an engineer would find their first line of code, lines of code on live within a week. Same uh, for a PM would find probably the first small feature on live within the week, first week or two. Last um, principle is transparency. So we keep things very, very transparent to the entire organization. We maintain a very, very clear and transparent tech pipeline that involves both feature work and uh, technical work. Um, we keep it updated on a, on a weekly basis. We keep stakeholders deeply involved in that, which creates a lot of buy-in and creates a lot of uh, commitment also from the stakeholders and, of course, prevents a lot of surprises. Technical tasks are on the pipeline, and we are religiously believing in fast decision-making. So we make fast decisions in tech. We require fast decisions from the business, and it's very, very rare that uh, a business decision like a big strategic one is take, taking very long time to, to make a total one. Some more things that help us. So we have an engineering and product alliance. In some companies, it's kind of this is engineering, this is product. With us, uh, we fight together to, to deliver. 
then we use a very uh, a cutting edge tech stack to make sure that we are always uh, in line with the market. We have very strong engineering challenges around performance, around data science, around uh, in basically in everything we do, we try to do the best. Our QAs focus a lot on automation. We strongly believe A in QA, some companies don't, uh, but we believe in QA automation, and of course there is always this manual gap that has to be done, but this saves us a lot of time. We offer quite strong employee incentives, so personal development budgets. We have uh, basically an unlimited uh, team building budget, and we offer relocation support. And very importantly, we believe in uh, no bullshit and delivery focused environment, so no big discussions around things that are quite obvious. Finally, some fun facts on, on, on Auto One. So we have an average of nine releases per day across the platform. We currently have 220 people in tech. Uh, of them, there is 150 engineers. We have um, uh, over 150 open tech positions uh, across our tech centers in Europe and the US. We've opened seven new ones in the past 12 months, and we're going to open three more in 2018. And who knows, maybe we open one in Cluj. That's it. Thank you.